We're just giving it another minute to let everybody get logged on real quick. All right, well, welcome everyone to the IBD update with Indiana University. My name is Tatiana Narwald and I'm the new executive director of the Indiana chapter of the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. I would like to thank you all for joining us today to better understand the challenges of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. The foundation is committed to empowering IBD patients to take charge of their care. Research has demonstrated that engagement with foundations such as ours results in increased disease knowledge and resiliency, which has been consistently correlated with better health outcomes for patients. I hope that you leave here today having learned a new approach to take with your disease, a new question to ask your care team, or a new piece of hope. The mission of the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation is to find a cure for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis and to improve the quality of life for children and adults with these diseases. We cannot achieve this mission without funding critical research projects. The foundation has invested over $400 million in finding these causes, treatments, and cures for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And we won't stop until we realize our vision of a future free from Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Today, you will hear from an incredible team of IBD healthcare professionals from Indiana University to learn more about your journey with diseases. But I hope your journey with the foundation does not end today. Our local Indiana chapter hosts several events and programs throughout the year, and we hope that you will become a part of our IBD family by participating in these events or by getting involved as a volunteer. I'd like to take a few moments to share with you what we have lined up for the beginning of 2023. We are looking for leaders within our state who share their IBG journey and aren't afraid to make ask to become leaders in our organization, whether that is as a medical professional and you join our healthcare professionals engagement committee, you join a fundraising event committee, or you just host your own fundraising team. On June 10th, we will all come together for our Take Steps event. We have this annually and it's at Connor Prairie up in Feshers. This is often the first time individuals will get to interact with others in the community that are facing exactly the challenges that they're facing. So grab your friends, your coworkers, whoever it may be, and have a fundraising team with us and have a great time at our walk. If you are a medical professional, as I said, we are starting a brand new healthcare professionals engagement committee, in which we will be sharing resources with each other on a quarterly basis. If you're interested in any of that, please send me a chat or send me an email. I'll shoot it in the chat box later. I'd be happy to sit down with you and figure out the right fit. Now, just a few housekeeping items. You all have been placed on mute for the webinar. The presentation will be recorded and accessible to view after the completion of today's program. If you have any questions for our panelists, please feel free to type them in the Q&A box at any time throughout the program. We will try our best to answer all the questions, but we will also have a specific Q&A section at the very end in which we will try to get to as many as we possibly can. As a reminder, please keep your questions general and not personal in nature. Uh, we don't want to go against anything or share any of that information. So please just generally speaking, um, ask those questions. If you have any additional questions or need some help with that, please feel free to send your hosts a chat specifically and we'll figure that out for you. So without further ado, I'm very honored to introduce our moderator for today's program, Dr. Sashi Sagi. Dr. Sagi is an adult gastroenterologist and associate professor of clinical medicine at Indiana University. Uh, thank you, Tatiana. Um, it's my pleasure to invite all of you uh, to this uh, session this morning, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, we have a distinguished uh, set of speakers, uh, which I'm all of whom uh, I'm proud to call my colleagues. The first speaker today is Dr. Khalid Abdul-Jawad. He's an assistant professor of medicine at uh, Indiana University. 
and he's based out of Ashkenazi Hospital, and he also practices uh, at uh, Witham Hospital in Lebanon and also at Margaret Mary Hospital in Batesville. Uh, he's a clinician educator, and he's going to talk about new therapies for inflammatory bowel disease. Khalid. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. All right. Thank you for this introduction, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining this exciting uh, session. Um, so today I'll be talking about uh, uh, new therapies in inflammatory bowel disease. Um, I have nothing to disclose. Um, the objectives of se this session are to briefly touch on basic concepts in managing IBD, uh, differentiate between two treatment ca categories in IBD, uh, which are biologics and small molecules, then explore newly uh, FDA-approved treatments options for uh, IBD. Um, so uh, what are the modern goals of IBD ma management? Uh, the first goal is early and accurate diagnosis, which should include uh, clarification of the phenotype um, uh, by knowing the location, behavior, and severity, and also to assess the prognosis and the presence of extra intestinal manifestation. Um, Um, the second goal uh, is to induce remission, which means uh, turning up inflammation quickly, improve symptoms, and to normalize the initial abnormal labs uh, and nutrition. Um, after successful induction of remission, then we can move to the next target, which is uh, maintenance. Uh, it's about uh, um, uh, uh, prevention of relapses over time, stable disease control, and optimizing therapies. Um, and by preventing relapses, then we can move to our final goal, uh, which is active monitoring of the disease, therapies, and to prevent complications related to the disease itself or treatment like infections or um, uh, cancers. Um, what causes IBD? Uh, there, are, there are multiple theories. Um, uh, we think it's a mix of uh, gut microorganisms uh, disruption, um, um, immune system hyperactivation, uh, genetics or environmental factors. Um, uh, traditionally, most uh, available IBD treatments target overactive uh, immune uh, system. Um, IBD treatments uh, uh, evolved over the years. Uh, old small molecules were the mainstay of therapy up until the past two decades. Then uh, therapies uh, have been dominated by the use of biologics through various classes. Uh, but now we are entering an exciting era of uh, small molecules, which is opening um, uh, new opportunities to patients. Um, uh, biologics are antibodies created in the lab by biological rather than chemical process uh, from living uh, microorganisms or cells. Uh, they can stop uh, uh, certain proteins in the body called cytokines from causing inflammation. Uh, whereas small molecules are made chemically, have a more stable uh, and simpler structure. Uh, so compared to biologics, uh, they are available uh, orally, uh, uh, don't form antibodies that fight the uh, medicine, and they act uh, quickly. Um, uh, I will go uh, briefly through new FDA-approved treatments uh, for IBD. Uh, the first uh, uh, new drug uh, category I'll talk about uh, as anti-interleukin antibodies. Uh, the first available drug in this category is ustekinumab or Stelara, uh, which was approved for management of moderate severe Crohn's disease in 2016 and uh, ulcerative colitis in 2019. Uh, interleukins uh, are naturally occurring, occurring cytokines uh, and trigger uh, inflammatory responses. Uh, through certain proteins, um, uh, they bind to receptors found on the uh, uh, T cells of the immune system, which makes them produce substances uh, that cause, uh, uh, causes inflammation in the gut. Um, uh, Ustekinumab uh, blocks interleukin 12 and uh, 23 and prevents their interaction with the T lymphocyte cell surface receptor, uh, subsequently uh, inhibiting pro-inflammatory uh, sub substances production. Uh, however, it turns out that interleukin-12 uh, might not uh, be very helpful to block an IBD, 
So there is a new uh, uh, agent called Rizinkizumab or Skyrizy uh, that specifically blocks interleukin-23. Uh, this specificity might have better safety profile and more effectiveness. Uh, Rizinkizumab was approved for management of moderate severe Crohn's disease as first line um, uh, of June of this year. Um, um, Ustekinumab has been shown to be efficacious in managing moderate severe Crohn's disease in the uh, uh, UNITY trial. Uh, two induction trials sh uh, showed uh, promising results uh, in patients who have failed at least one anti-TNF treatment like Remicade or Humira, and to a more degree, patients who never failed an, an anti-TNF uh, treatment by week, uh, week eight. It's also superior to placebo in maintaining remission at uh, week uh, 44. Um, 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 um. Same thing for uh, moderate severe ulcerative colitis. Uh, the uh, UNIFI uh, trial proved uh, uh, the efficacy to induce remission by week eight and to maintain it by week 44. Uh, for both Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, ustekinumab is given as uh, weight-based uh, IV infusion for induction at the beginning, followed by uh, uh, subcutaneous injections uh, every eight weeks for maintenance. Um, safety is a big uh, point in favor of ustekinumab. Data from uh, clinical trials showed that compared to placebo, ustekinumab had no increased risk of major uh, adverse cardiac events, uh, venous thromboembolism, malignancies, or serious infections, and there is very low risk of developing antibodies against the drug. Um, what about rezinkizumab? Uh, it was FDA approved for three indications, plexoriasis, uh, psoriatic arthritis and Crohn's. Uh, the uh, efficacy of uh, rezinkizumab in management of moderate to, to severe Crohn's disease was examined in two induction trials for 12 weeks and then a maintenance trial um, um, uh, for um, uh, uh, until 52 weeks. Uh, results showed superiority of rezinkizumab uh, compared to placebo to induce and maintain endoscopic response and clinical remission uh, in, in all trials. Uh, in the induction phase, um, um, uh, it's given as an IV uh, uh, infusion at week zero, uh, four, and eight, and then given as maintenance as subcutaneous injections every uh, eight weeks. What about safety uh, of uh, rezinkizumab? Uh, reassuring data so far, uh, very low risk of serious adverse events, serious infections, major adverse cardiac events, and uh, mortality. Uh, however, uh, it's noticed that there is a, uh, a, a slight uh, increased risk of uh, liver dysfunction or change in liver function in few patients. Uh, therefore, it's not recommended to use uh, in patients with chronic liver disease. Now I'm going to shift gears and review the new available small molecules. Um, um, the first category in the small molecule family is the Ginus kinase inhibitors or JAK inhibitors. Um, uh, Tovacetinib or Zelgen uh, 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 was the first FDA-approved small molecule in IBD in 2018. Uh, Ovacetinib or Renvoc um, uh, was approved this year. Uh, they are both indicated in management of, of moderate severe ulcerative colitis only after failing an anti-TNF treatment like Remicade or Humira. Uh, as you can see, those medications are used in uh, other conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, uh, which can coexist with inflammatory bowel disease. Um, how do JAK inhibitors work? Uh, so an inflammatory um, um, uh, stimulus around the gut binds to a uh, T cell of the immune system. Uh, they uh, uh, interact uh, uh, with intracellular proteins called JAKs. Uh, then they activate uh, another set of proteins called STATs, uh, which sends a message to the nucleus of the uh, cell uh, to produce inflammatory mediators uh, and induce inflammatory response. Um, um, JAK inhibitors block uh, these uh, uh, signal transduction pathways, resulting in downregulation of a variety of uh, uh, inflammatory mediators. Um, um, opacetinib inhibits JAK1, which might be more specific to the gut compared to tovacetinib, uh, which inhibits uh, other subtypes of JAKs. Uh, uh, both medications have been shown in clinical trials to be uh, more effective than placebo to induce and maintain remissions uh, in patients with moderate severe uh, ulcerative colitis. Interestingly, 
Uh, the trials also showed response in patients with uh, prior exposure for anti-TNFs, anti uh, which give hope to patients uh, who have failed uh, other or multiple treatment options uh, in the past. Um, uh, Tovacetinib is taken as 10 milligrams orally twice a day uh, for eight, eight weeks in the induction period, followed by five milligrams orally twice a day for maintenance. Uh, whereas uh, ovacetinib is taken as 45 milligrams daily uh, for eight weeks for induction, then for, for maintenance will depend on severity, um, uh, 15 milligrams orally daily or 30 milligrams uh, orally daily. Um, the safety of JAK inhibitors in clinical trials have been evaluated. They are generally well tolerated. Um, it's observed that there is a dose relationship, increased risk of uh, non-serious herpes zoster infection. Therefore, vaccination against uh, shingles is recommended. Uh, major adverse uh, cardiac events uh, were very low in the ulcerative colitis studies. However, uh, data from rheumatoid arthritis studies showed uh, increased risk of pulmonary embolism and deep uh, venous thrombosis, especially with higher doses uh, in elderly patients and patients with risk factors for coronary vascular disease. Therefore, the FDA put a black box warning requesting to only use JAK inhibitors after failing an anti-TNF. Uh, some important information about JAK inhibitors, they are taken orally, which is a big advantage. Uh, nice thing about them is that they act quickly uh, uh, within days. Uh, they are contraindicated in patients with low white blood cell count, uh, severe liver disease, and coronary vascular disease risk factors. And it should not uh, it should not be used in pregnancy. So contraception is recommended in female patients in the child bearing age. Uh, before starting it, baseline complete blood count, uh, comprehensive metabolic panel, and lipid profile should be obtained and followed. And we recommend to update vaccinations, uh, especially against shingles. Uh, the next small molecule class is the uh, 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 sphingosine 1-phosphate receptor modulator. Um, uh, Ozanamid or Zipoisia as an example, uh, which was FDA approved for moderate to severe uh, uh, ulcerative colitis as first line treatment uh, in 2021, and it's also used to treat multiple sclerosis. Uh, how does it work? Um, uh, lymphocytes are part of the white blood cell, uh, uh, which are the defense line in the blood. Uh, when activated, uh, they play a role in inflammation. Uh, but lymphocytes have to leave um, um, uh, the lymph nodes uh, in the body before they go to the gut and cause inflammation. Uh, S1P is a signaling molecule uh, which interacts with the uh, S1P uh, receptor uh, on the surface of lymphocytes to facilitate their migration uh, from lymph nodes. Pozanamid um, uh, binds uh, to S1P receptors and prevents the migration of lymphocytes uh, uh, to the circulation and inflamed gut. Uh, so it's like a lymphocyte anti-trafficking agent. Uh, in clinical trials, the True North study group uh, showed that ozanamid was superior to placebo uh, to induce clinical remission at uh, 10 weeks and to maintain it uh, by week uh, uh, 52. Um, as for safety, this is a relatively safe medication based on uh, available signals so far. Uh, uh, most common side effects uh, uh, are headaches and benign and transient increase in the uh, uh, liver tests. In terms of serious infections and malignancies, uh, uh, no major issues are noticed except for slight increased risk of shock. Uh, therefore, vaccine is recommended. Um, it's an oral medication uh, taken once a day, which is a big ad advantage. Uh, those titration is needed in the first week due to uh, risk of slight drop in heartbeat um, uh, at the uh, beginning. Uh, it should be avoided in patients with uh, um, uh, severe obstructive sleep apnea or heartbeat problems. Uh, and in patients who had coronary artery disease or uh, cerebrovascular accidents in the last six months. Uh, it increases the risk of macular edema, which is an eye problem. So it's used uh, uh, with caution in diabetic patients. Uh, therefore, fundoscopic eye exam uh, is recommended in those patients and in patients with history of inflammatory eye conditions like uveitis. Um, before starting it, uh, uh, we get a baseline AKG, lymphocyte count, uh, and liver function test. 
uh, we recommend to update vaccination, uh, especially against shingles. And finally, it should not be used in pregnancy as we have limited data regarding that. Uh, therefore, con uh, contraception is recommended in female patients in the child-bearing uh, age. Uh, now I'm going to briefly touch on biosimilars, uh, which you may uh, have recently heard about them. So what are they? Um, they are almost uh, identical copies of an original biogic, but manufactured by uh, a different company. Um, as we learned before, biologics have complex uh, structure. Uh, uh, so biosimilars cannot be exact copies of the original uh, uh, biologic therapies. Uh, they have negligible uh, structural differences, but still uh, contain the same active ingredient, work the same way with the same dosing and route of administration and share similar uh, safety profile. Uh, they are uh, mainly required to be used by uh, payers instead of the originator uh, medicine. Uh, biosimilars uh, um, uh, available uh, in the USA are only in infliximab or Remicid biosimilars such as Inflictra, Reniflex, and uh, Avsolo. Uh, uh, maybe more to come in the future with other uh, biologics. Um, at the end, I want to highlight that IBD treatments uh, are not perfect. Uh, as you saw from clinical trials, success rates uh, are rarely above 50%. And up until now, we don't have a tool to know uh, which patient will respond to certain treatment or not. Uh, therefore, we use personalized medicine approach to position treatments to fit uh, each patient. Um, uh, so we take into consideration disease severity and prognosis, um, 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 uh, other patients-related factors like age and comorbidities for safety reasons, and presence of extra-intestinal manifestation. Uh, patients' preference and route of administration uh, uh, are always uh, respected and considered factors. Uh, but at the uh, uh, end of the day, uh, um, um, and in real-life practice, uh, coverage and insurance may dictate the show and sometimes it might not be for the uh, uh, best interest of the patient. Uh, so in many cases, we have to uh, appeal those decisions and advocate um, uh, to, to our patients. And with this, I will end my talk and uh, thank you everyone. Uh, thank you, Khaled, for the excellent review. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Matthew Bohm. Uh, he is an associate professor of clinical medicine at Indiana University. Um, he's very active in research, has a busy clinical practice based out of University Hospital. And he also has a practice on the north side of Indianapolis in uh, Carmel. He's gonna to talk to us about uh, a very commonly uh, asked topic, which is uh, diet and dietary interventions in IBD. Thank you, Matt. I'm having some trouble opening my video. Um, do you not want me? Oh, there I go. I was allowed to. Welcome. Uh, thanks for coming out on a Saturday morning. Sashi, thanks for inviting me. And thanks to the Crohn's Colitis Foundation for having all of us too to do this important uh, talks on education. Um, I know a lot of you are patients or some are new and uh, we welcome everybody. So we'll get started. All right, things are working. These are my disclosures. This is the disclosure for the program. Okay, hold on one second. Just gotta minimize this, there we go. So I, I thought I'd first start the talk off with just some examples or information on malnutrition and some dietary recommendations during flare-ups. So malnutrition is pretty common in inflammatory bowel disease, whether it's ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. Uh, with the Crohn's disease involving the small intestines or the entire GI tract, you can have issues with digesting foods, absorbing nutrients, having diarrhea, things moving through you too fast. And you have issues uh, absorbing iron, which is absorbed in the top of the small intestines and vitamin B12, which is absorbed in the bottom of the small intestines. And B12 is very common, especially if people have disease in their ileum, which is 
specifically the terminal illing, which is the last part of the small intestines, the most common place Crohn's occurs. The large intestines, uh, not as important for absorbing nutrients or, uh, or any real nutrients, I should say, or substance. Most of that occurs in the small intestines, but it is important for absorbing water, some electrolytes, and some uh, fatty acids. And people without a colon, as some uh, may know, or experience is they have lots of issues potentially with dehydration because of uh, water absorption issues because the colon absorbs about one to three liters of water per day. So what are some causes of malnutrition and inflammatory bowel disease? Uh, severe diarrhea is probably one of the more common ones, again, because it can cause dehydration, you get uh, depleted in fluids, electrolytes, uh, such as like sodium and potassium, and that can cause cramps and it also leads to weight loss. And then when people have frequent diarrhea, they try you know, to avoid eating because they don't wanna have diarrhea, whether they have to go to work or go to school or, or just live day to day or travel. Uh, patients are having significant abdominal pain or nausea that obviously reduces your appetite and you don't wanna eat because you don't wanna have pain for the same reason that you don't wanna have diarrhea and then they don't consume enough calories and over time they become malnourished. <clears throat> Rectal bleeding uh, leads to loss of iron, um, which is a main component of blood and you need iron to make new blood cells. So over time you become anemic and iron deficient. And then frequent bowel movements, as we said, people avoid eating, avoid uh, due to travel. Sometimes people are taking Imodium because they have to do things or you know, they're just become at risk of malnourished just because they're limiting their food intake. So then this leads to the complications of malnutrition and the complications could be weight loss. It could be problems with vitamins such as vitamin A, D, E, and K, which are your fat soluble vitamins, vitamin B12. And then they can also have other issues. You cannot, uh, sorry for the dog in the background, um, life of Zoom. So you could have decreased bone strength. You can have problems with calcium, problems with vitamin D. Uh, inflammation itself can cause malnutrition. And then long-term long use of medicine, such as steroids can cause muscle wasting and other medications can cause side effects like methotrexate can cause nausea. And then other complications um, could be, especially in children, we worry about growth delays. So when I, when I chat with patients in the, in the midst of a flare, uh, I try to tell them to limit these foods. And, and I, I put maybe all the time, and I don't think insoluble fibers need to be avoided all the time, but some of these other things that I think uh, are important to limit, especially with autoimmune diseases, especially uh, with gut autoimmune diseases, is dairy products, milk, cheese, and yogurt, fake sugar. So that's your diet drinks, your Splendas, your Sweet and Lows, your Stevias, um, they, they just promote gas, bloating, and diarrhea, and uh, they're chemicals, and I think you want to limit chemicals and toxins in the GI tract. Anything with high sugar or high fructose corn syrup, that's kind of pretty much our westernized diet that has tons of sugar in it, uh, in addition to high fat foods, and, and just in general, it's healthier just to limit these things for overall health and weight and nutrition and uh, to have a good diet. And then alcohol and caffeine, and I'm not opposed to people, you know, having, you know, alcohol or, you know, drinking coffee or tea or having caffeine at other times, but during flare-ups, these can make your symptoms worse. So then you may ask, what can I eat when I'm in a flare? So we, we usually say low fiber fruits, such as bananas and melons, lean proteins are always good, chicken, turkeys, porks, fish, some refined grains as oatmeal, pasta and rice, um, fully cooked, sealess, skinless veggies. Now we worry more about these like roughage and, and fiber and what we call, you know, residue like skins and nuts and seeds and popcorn, you know, with people that have a lot of inflammation in their small intestines. They may have narrowings in their small intestines or strictures because these things can get hung up because they come out like they go in. But cooked things that are soft are, are usually okay. And then homemade drinks, protein shakes, nutritional drinks are usually okay. Some of them could be high in sugar. Uh, Boost and Insure are good ones. They, they could be a little bit high in sugar. Some people don't like them. 
They have some dairy in them. Carnation Instant Breakfast is a kind of alternative that's a cheaper way too, because Boosted Insure is pretty expensive. And I usually tell them, you know, to try to mix it with water. Sometimes if you're really hurting on calories, I go against my dairy rule and I say mix it with whole milk because it has high fat and high protein just to get some extra calories in. And then Modulin, which is a uh, elemental formula, it's approved now in the US. They've done a lot of studies in Europe and, and in uh, Israel. It's pretty expensive though. And Kate Farms drinks, which is another alternative to Boost and Insures. We use them, our dietitians use them. They're just a plant-based plant -based drink. It comes from, the protein comes from peas. So then there's a lot of different diets out there. And, and if you go on the Crohn's Colitis Foundation website, you'll see a lot of these listed. So I'm gonna to touch on a few of these and kind of give some pointers. Uh, we have the anti-inflammatory diet, the specific carbohydrate diet, the Mediterranean diet, the Crohn's, Crohn's disease exclusion diet, and then enteral and partial enteral diets. And these are mainly formulas that are highly digested, easy, easy to absorb, uh, kind of not to stimulate the GI tract to do much work and uh, not to disrupt the microbiome, which is the bacteria in the intestines. And sometimes these enteral nutrition diets are used in combination with other diets as well, which I'll talk about briefly. So the anti-inflammatory diet, it's kind of a combination of the specific carbohydrate diet and also incorporating pre prebiotics, which promote good bacterial growth and probiotics, which contain microorganisms. And there, there's numerous probiotics in I'm kind of iffy on probiotics in, in, in my own feeling because there's really no oversight on these pills and you don't know what bacteria you're getting. You don't know what's alive, what's not alive. Some patients say this one works for me. And I think if it works for you, that's okay. Again, I always take it with a grain of salt that you don't know exactly what you're getting. And the goal is to, to incorporate and improve your gut microbiome to get healthy bacteria. We know that patients, when their colon is sick and we have good data in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis and in, in people with C. diff colitis, that usually the bacteria is usually populated with not so healthy bacteria and we try to repopulate it with healthy bacteria. And, and it's proven that that helps with you know, fecal transplants in patients with C. diff. That's an, it, it works over 90% of the time in patients in, in, in that group. And there's good studies with ulcerative colitis that show uh, and people that it improves in about 25% uh, that get better with ulcerative colitis when you repopulate with healthy uh, bacteria. It's not approved, uh, just FYI, fecal transplants are not approved for treatment of ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, but they are in use currently for the treatment of C. diff colitis when it's refractory. So the, the specific carbohydrate diet, it, it excludes complex carbohydrates. It, it tries to get you to avoid complex grains, oats, barley, corn. So it's kind of like the gluten-free diet, quinoa and rice, which are somewhat allowed in gluten-free and avoids dairy products except for hard cheeses. And uh, they substitute sugar with honey. Uh, complex carbohydrates in general are tough to digest and they contribute to dysbiosis, which is altered bacteria. Again, that bad bacteria in, in the gut uh, which then leads to disruption of the intestinal barrier, which is kind of these little, on a microscopic level, the little barrier between the cells and the colon or the small bowel, and then inflammatory cells get in there and bad bacteria gets in there, and that which can lead to some of the process of ulceration and flare-ups of inflammatory bowel disease. So the goal is eliminating these complex carbohydrates and dairy and other such foods such as sugar, like high fructose corn syrup and just general sugar to try to not uh, alter the microbiome, to try to get a healthy microbiome, to decrease the disruption of this barrier and decrease inflammation on this microscopic level. The next diet is the Mediterranean diet. And this diet has proven really a, a good diet in cardiovascular disease too. They, they did a head-to-head -head trials in a big journal, I think it was in JAMA, which is a big medicine journal years ago that showed the Mediterranean diet uh, patients did far better than uh, the low fat diet. And this diet is high in raw vegetables. It's high in fruits. Again, some people can't eat some of these things if they have narrowings or strictures in their intestines from Crohn's disease or even ulcerative colitis. 
you get high fatty acids from unsaturated fat, like uh, olive oil, nuts, avocado. They uh, try to eat lots of fish, low in intake of red meat, a low intake of processed foods. I think processed food elimination is a very important part of the diet because processed foods, mainly things that can sit on your shelf for more than a couple of weeks is what I tell patients, have a lot of emulsifiers, which basically hold foods together. They have a lot of preservatives. Again, chemicals, not good for the GI tract. So uh, also when you eat these types of foods with the vegetables and the fruits and the, and the lean meats and fish, they, they have high antioxidants. They have a good source of vitamins, vitamin A, C, beta carotene, minerals, flavonoids, such as which is high in, in dark chocolates. Um, and this may have an anti-inflammatory effect on the gut. So there was a big study that, that we were part of. It was through the Crohn's Colitis Foundation, actually called the Dying Study. They did a head-to-head -head trial of the Mediterranean versus the specific carbohydrate diet. There was no control group, meaning there was no placebo group. So they just did it, you know, half the people went on to Mediterranean, half the people went on the specific carbohydrate diet. And it showed after six weeks that both diets did well in uh, regards to patients going into clinical remission, meaning that they felt better, or their symptoms were better. Um, and about half the patients. And the good part about it is the remission persisted up to 12 weeks um, with these dietary modifications. And again, we didn't do endoscopy on these patients, which is a scope to look to see if the Crohn's or, was better, but we did do uh, fecal calprotectin, which is a stool test that measures inflammation in the gut and then about a third or more had an improvement in that level. So the diets did work, symptoms got better, the calprotectin got better. The next diet I'm going to mention is the Crohn's disease exclusion diet. Um, you can use this diet alone or in combination with a par partial enteral nutrition diet, which again is, is a formula that you drink. Um, there's different formulas that this encompasses. The modulin is that one that I discussed earlier. There's another one made by Abbott Labs, which you can even buy on Amazon called Vital Peptide. I'm trying to do a, a research study with the Crohn's disease elimination diet in combination with the vital peptide um, in patients with mild to moderate Crohn's. Uh, hopefully that will be going live within the next two to three months. So some of you may be eligible for that study. Uh, so these diets, uh, it involves a diet high in protein. It's kind of somewhat similar to the Mediterranean. Why um, somewhat low in animal fat, meaning low in red meat, low in gluten. And I'm not as a stringent on the gluten, but definitely when you're low in gluten, that eliminates processed foods. And you are allowed to have fiber. Uh, the diet does exclude wheat and dairy and some animal fats, mainly red meats, additives, which are basically the emulsifiers, preservatives, and processed foods. And there are mandatory sources of, of pectin and um, some starches from fruits and vegetables. They use a lot of potatoes early on in the diet. And it's a phase diet, meaning that there's usually a six week phase diet, and then you add foods the following six weeks. And you usually need a dietitian to help you along with this. It's not something you should try to do on your own. Our dietitians in our clinic do use this diet. We send patients to them to put patients on the diet, but they're closely monitored, which is important. And uh, again, used alone or used with the partial enteral diet. So just to touch on some data recently with the Crohn's elimination diet, this was first studied in children. This study was done in Israel and 80% of children in this diet who used the Crohn's disease elimination diet plus the partial enteral diet were in remission at six weeks. 75% of the remission uh, did occur in a, in a group when they just used enteral nutrition. So they were just drinking their diet. So both diets worked well. In the adults uh, at six weeks, about 68% of patients did better with the Crohn's elimination diet, plus the drinking, the nutrition, partial nutrition. Uh, and it was a little bit better than just the patient in the Crohn's disease elimination diet alone. Again, this diet, 80% was still in remission at six months. And this one did do scopes and 35% were remission um, on the scopes. Lastly, just again, touching base on the exclusive enteral in the diet, which is just basically drinking your nutrition. There's specialized nutritional formulas. This has been around forever, and especially in children. Um, the European Crohn's Colitis Organization even uh, recommends this for six to eight weeks as initial induction uh, of remission for patients with mild to moderate Crohn's disease in the pediatric population. 
And the, the important thing is using diet to induce remission was just as effective as steroids. So it could avoid steroids, uh, which as you know, has long-term side effects. And I think I just finished on time and um, I'll be available for, for questions later about diets. Uh, thank you, Matt. That was an excellent review. Um, the next uh, speaker that we have uh, is somebody who doesn't need uh, much introduction. Uh, Dr. Monica Fisher is a professor of medicine at Indiana University. She's the director of inflammatory bowel diseases um, at Indiana University and also uh, the director for uh, stool transplantation or fecal microbiota transplantation at IU. She is world renowned for her research on stool transplantation in the treatment of uh, recurrent C. diff infection and uh, has ongoing uh, research in the treatment of uh, C. diff infection in IBD patients. Uh, she's going to tell us about complementary and alternative uh, medicines in uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Sashi. Um, good morning, everybody. So what is CAM? CAM uh, is defined as healthcare approaches that are not typically part of conventional medical care or that might have origins outside our usual Western practice. Complementary means that this therapy is used together with conventional medicine and alternative means that this treatment is used in place of conventional medicine. Um, um, ideally, uh, either complementary or alternative should be used, right? Or either would say complementary should be used together uh, with um, a usual or a mainstream approach in a coordinated way and that we call integrative medicine. I have issues with, doesn't seem to forward, sorry guys. All right. So what um, types of complementary and alternative um, medicines approaches we have? A lot of things can constitute for CAM, and we can uh, categorize that into four overlapping um, uh, categories, such as drugs and nutritional approaches, psychological uh, interventions, and physical interventions. So why patients consider CAM? Probably I don't have to tell you guys why, because many of them, many of you consider this, and many of our IBD patients use CAM, and it's um, estimated that up to 60% of our patients actually use CAM, because naturally we want to search or we find the unoptimal therapy. Uh, most of my patients want to avoid immunosuppression. Uh, admittedly, our IBD therapies are far from perfect. Um, and most of the time, unfortunately, they are either ineffective or, or they have certain side effects that are not acceptable. Often cost is an issue. And many of uh, the medications are super expensive and not necessarily uh, covered by insurance companies. And of, of course, all of us wanna be in control of our treatment. And at the end, we all want safer, um, approaches than the conventional treatment can offer. So what are the concerns or what are the physician concerns with CAM? First of all, they are not regulated by the FDA. There are really no or, or relatively low number of well-designed studies with low sample sites and poor study designs. Um, we are concerned about the safety. Um, often our patients don't discuss the use of um, alternative or complementary treatments with us. And often, and this is the most uh, concerning uh, thing for us, that they discontinue the conventional treatment because they um, choose to um, take an alternative or uh, complementary medication. So what are the commonly used herbal medicines? Um, in IBD. The ones that are listed in bold are the ones that either have um, the most 
convincing results in clinical trials or studies, or um, patients express the most interest in them. And these are wormwood, uh, cannabis, curcumin, uh, mere caramel extract, and coffee charcoal that is actually widely used in Germany, and the plantago vata seed or psyllium uh, dessert Indian wheat. Probably most of you don't need an introduction to cannabis. Um, cannabis refers to all products derived from the plant cannabis sativa. Cannabinoids are the group of substances that are extracted from the cannabis plant. The THC, the tetrahydrocannabinol, has the cytropic effect and also anti-nausea and anti-emetic effect. CBD or cannabidiol, uh, cannabidiol and often available in an oil form or in capsules, has anti-inflammatory and perceived immunomodulatory effect. And there is over a hundred other cannabinoids. So the cannabis uh, or the cannabinoids um, have an effect through our endocannabinoid system. There are two types of endo endocannabinoid receptors, the CB1 and the CB2. Um, they uh, decrease gut motility. They also help with visceral or belly pain. They reduce cytokine production uh, and leukocyte infiltration to the gut specifically through the CB2. And therefore, they potentially decrease intestinal inflammation. So it's a reasonable thought to think that they would work to control or help to control um, IBD. So what, is the clinical, what do the clinical trials show us? Um, the initial or first trial was a small um, Israeli trial um, in, in 21 patients from Israel for Crohn's disease. Half of the patients received THC cigarettes. The other ones received um, a cannabis placebo, which was um, a cigarette that smelled like um, a cannabis, but patients still could tell which one they were receiving. The primary endpoint was clinical remission after eight weeks. And, and unfortunately, in this trial, the primary endpoint was not met. Well, you can see on the right side, 45% um, received remission, uh, achieved remission on um, THC, 10% on placebo, but the difference was not clinically significant. And more patients responded to THC than placebo, uh, but again, the primary endpoint, which was achieving clinical remission, was not achieved because the difference was not significantly different. And uh, the same group in Israel um, did another study when they used CBD oil uh, using for Crohn's patients. And they again um, offered it to 20 patients. They randomized them either receiving CBD oil uh, or olive oil twice a day. And unfortunately, they did not um, observe any CBD oil-related uh, benefits over placebo. So it did not work. How about CBD for ulcerative colitis? Another study, including 60 patients, used, this, used it in addition to mesalamine and unfortunately found no difference in achieving clinical remission or um, in lowering the carfotectin. Uh, in addition, uh, nearly one third of patients withdrew because they didn't see any effect or had side effect on the CBD. Although many patients on CBD um, uh, reported improvement in quality uh, of life. Um, overall, um, 334 studies uh, showed, or the meta-analysis overall of these 334 studies showed that there is no convincing evidence that marijuana uh, significantly um, impact IBD outcomes. However, it can improve health perception and symptoms, but again, no improvement in clinical response remission or improvement in biomarkers. So overall, uh, we do not recommend the use of cannabis for the treatment of IBD. However, we, um, I especially admit that might help with quality of life issues and help to control some of the symptoms. And I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry to say that I have to run down to uh, plug in my computer because it's running low. So just bear with me for a second. I need a charger.
I'll make a plug right now while she's plugging in her computer that if you have any questions, don't forget, you can throw them in the questions and answers chat and we will try to get the appropriate panelists to answer them uh, now in text or at the end of our presentation. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm back. Um, I apologize for this. <laughs> okay, the problem with the cannabis is that it has significant side effects. It um, provokes anxiety, psychosis. It's known to decrease fertility, cause the so-called hyperemesis syndrome, and also withdrawal syndrome, which will manifest as irritability, sleep di disturbance, anorexia, and depressed mood. How about turmeric? Um, curcuma longa uh, is a plant root from the ginger family, and it's probably many you many of you use it. It's commonly used in Asian cuisine. Curcumin is a major active ingredient. To keep in mind that only three percent um, uh, of the turmeric root contains the active ingredient, the curcumin, and indeed it has anti-inflammatory properties. Curcumin has been extensively studied, um, adding to mescalamine for the treatment of mild to moderate UC. Uh, several studies used it for both induction of remission and maintenance of remission of UC. The dose that used um, in this clinical trial range between 1.45 grams to 3 uh, grams daily. And indeed, um, they showed significant improvement um, uh, and significant difference um, uh, in achieving remission and maintaining remission when curcumin was added to mesalamine. How about in Crohn's disease? There is one small trial which was recently uh, presented at our in, uh, national meeting showed that when high bioavailability curcumin was used, uh, 360 milligram daily, compared to placebo for mildly active Crohn's patient, the clinical remission that was achieved um, at 12 weeks was significantly higher than in those who received um, placebo. So maybe there is something in there um, for uh, or supporting the use of curcumin in Crohn's patient. You have to keep in mind that uh, turmeric curcumin has some side effects, while generally is well tolerated, um, but it can cause nausea in some patients. Abdominal pain can cause diarrhea, headaches, and stain the stool yellow. Other supplements that showed some benefit in smaller trials include the aloe vera, wheat, grass, juice, and wormwood, as well as psyllium uh, seeds. I must emphasize that fish oil and really showed no benefit in concord trials. How about therapies that focus on microbiome modulation? The gut microbiome, as you know, and you heard from that, is a collection of microbiomes that occur naturally in our gut. There's a hundred tri trillion of microbes that live in our colon. And it is well studied and described that IBD patients have abnormal microbial flora. The, uh, healthy bacteria are de uh, decreased um, both in diversity as in number. And microbial therapies um, uh, have been studies, have been studied extensively to help IBD. And they really try to correct imbalance uh, in this commercial flora that known to protect us. So how can we um, intervene? Um, obviously with changing diet, possibly probiotics and fecal microbiota transplantation. Probiotics are like microorganisms that are intended to have health benefits when they are consumed. But I must note that several trials show that once the uh, administration of probiotic is seized, they show no changes in the um, microbiota. 
uh, limited uh, study data suggests, though, there are benefits in ulcerative colitis, uh, possibly helping to induce benefit and maintaining remission in very mild disease, uh, and as well as in pouchitis, mostly in preventing uh, relapse of pouchitis and maintaining remission. Previously, we recommended VSL3. Now it's uh, rebranded uh, re as VisBiome. Yeah, I must note that probiotics have no benefit for Crohn's patients, and that is now included in all uh, guidelines. So I do not recommend for our Crohn's patients to buy and consume probiotics. So how about um, fecal microbiota transplantation? So as you probably heard a lot about um, fecal transplant in the last 10 years, it is um, healthy poop um, taken from a screened healthy donor and transferred to a recipient and got with the goal to restore the um, uh, homeostasis of the microbiota. It is very effective for uh, recurrent clostridios in uh, difficile infection. It can be administered via nasodiodonal tube, uh, like capsules, or colonoscopy, or enemas. And uh, this week, uh, the FDA approved the first uh, fecal microbiota uh, transplant product. Uh, it's called uh, Rebiota. It is currently only FDA approved for the treatment of recurrent um, C. difficile infection, not for IBD. So what kind of trial results we have on FMT in IBD patients? Um, to date, we have results from six randomized clinical trials. Um, this meta-analysis listed um, on this slide uh, summarized four of them that included a total of 277 patients in ulcerative colitis um, field. Um, here uh, in this meta-analysis, the FMT increased the likelihood of achieving remission in these patients at eight weeks by twofold. So 37% of patients who received FMT achieved a remission compared to 18% who received placebo. So it is a promising treatment uh, for the treatment of an ulcerative colitis. However, we are not there yet. There are small trials, mostly observational trials for Crohn's disease, and there's like really no conclusive um, results for Crohn's yet. There are many ongoing trials, but again, there is no um, FDA-approved treatment, uh, uh, FMT treatment for IBD. What about uh, mind-body therapies? Um, as you know, IBD patients have significantly higher rates of anxiety, depression, and stress plays a role, at least perceived role, in IBD flares. So any mind-body therapies that are aimed to reduce stress and in increase coping abilities, such as mindfulness, relaxation, hypnosis, yoga, exercise, and cognitive behavior therapy might be helpful. And overall, I recommend to all of my patients because it will improve quality of life and psychological status. Uh, but unfortunately, what we have seen from clinical trials they do not have significant effect on disease activity. So to summarize, some complementary therapies indeed in conjunction with traditional treatments can improve symptoms and disease activity and more, more, most importantly, quality of life. Uh, however, these therapies are not replacement for conventional treatment. And it is super important that if you use a CAM, and that you discuss it with your doctor and try to take an integrated approach. Um, thank you so much. And I, again, I'm so sorry, I didn't realize that my computer battery was running low and I had to go downstairs to get the charger. Uh, thank you, Monica, for that excellent overview. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Megan Walker, who is an assistant professor uh, of, of clinical medicine at Indiana University. She uh, practices out of the VA and also has a practice uh, on the north side of Indianapolis in Zionsville. Uh, she'll be talking about the importance of health maintenance in IBD. Thank you, Sashi, and um, thank you to the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation and for everyone being here this morning. Can you all hear me okay? Yes, we can. Uh, and then I have uh, no disclosures. 
All right, um, so for health maintenance in IBD, this is an important topic because unfortunately, um, studies have shown that patients with inflammatory bowel disease seem um, to be less likely to receive routine preventive care compared to general medical patients. And it does not seem to depend on whether their uh, inflammatory bowel disease is in remission or well controlled or whether they're flaring. Um, this discrepancy continued even if people were in good remission. So besides the general preventive care for, um, for general US population, there are some extra measures that are recommended for inflammatory bowel disease. And uh, some are especially for uh, those on immunosuppressive medications, which includes our immunomodulators like azathioprine and methotrexate, the biologics, um, which you heard about earlier, and the small molecules um, like Dr. Abdelzala talked about. So the topics that I will touch on today um, regarding health maintenance, vaccines, um, colorectal cancer prevention, um, cervical and skin cancer screening, um, bone density testing, and then some modifiable risk factors. So regarding vaccinations, um, annual flu vaccination is recommended for all patients with inflammatory bowel disease, regardless of what um, treatment that they're on but specifically um, patients who are on any medication that affects the immune system, like the categories I mentioned, should get the non-live uh, version of the flu vaccine, which in recent years, I believe has been the main one that you can get. Um, but there has been this live flu mist uh, that's administered nasally used. And so that should not be used in any patients on immunosuppression. And it's actually also recommended that um, family members or people who live in the same household with people on immunosuppression should also not receive that live um, nasal flu vaccine. Um, the next big category is pneumonia vaccines. And so I know a lot of um, people are diagnosed with their inflammatory bowel disease at younger ages. And so normally the things like pneumonia vaccines are not recommended until an older age. In the case of patients on these immunosuppressive therapies, really these pneumonia vaccines should be administered at regardless of age. Um, so the newer pneumonia vaccines that are out, um, there's one called PCD20, and that just refers to the strains of pneumonia that it is against or covering against. And so there's one called PCD20, so that can be administered alone or if someone receives um, the, the other uh, pneumonia vaccine, PCD15, this should be later followed by a second pneumonia vaccine called PTSD23, um, given at least eight weeks later, but can be further out than that. And then the other one that falls in the same similar category to the pneumonia vaccine that normally we don't start until age 50 in the general population, should be given to all patients um, on these medications that affect the immune system regardless of age. Um, Shingrix is the main vaccine now used in the United States uh, for, for this. There was a previous shingles vaccine called Zostavax, which was live and therefore could not be used in our, in our patients on these medications, but that vaccine is pretty much not available in the US anymore, so it should not be an issue. It's given um, as two doses, um, and it can be as early as just a month apart if, um, you, if you needed to, but most people space them out about six months. As far as um, timing of these vaccines, so our guidelines recommend when feasible, it's, it's ideal to try to administer these vaccines before a patient is started on a medication that affects the immune system. And the reasoning behind that is we wanna make sure that the vaccine can have the most effect. Um, the, the immune system can properly take it up and be able to recognize those infections in the future. That being said, the treatment of active inflammatory bowel disease should always take precedent. So it is absolutely not recommended to delay starting on a treatment for Crohn's or ulcerative colitis just to get a vaccine. So really the guidelines um, state, you know, they to start doing these vaccinations actually once a diagnosis is made. 
Um, so even, you know, when a patient diagnosed with mild ulcerative colitis starting on something like mesalamine, which isn't affecting the immune system, it's recommended to go ahead and start doing those vaccines then because there's a chance that in the future, medications which affect the immune system could be required. And so then these vaccines would already be done and out of the way. And then as I already alluded to a little bit, um, all live vaccines should be avoided in patients on the medicines that affect the immune system. Thankfully, there aren't many of these used in the adult population. Um, so I talked about the, the flu, the nasal flu one already. MMR usually is taken care of in childhood, but there's occasionally people who don't receive it until adulthood. And then the only other one is if you're going to go um, to an at-risk area with international travel, yellow fever is the other big one you might encounter as far as live vaccines to be aware of to avoid. And then the other vaccines that are recommended for, for IVD patients, um, they really follow just the, the CDC or IDSA guidelines on these, so hepatitis A, um, hepatitis B, which importantly, just this year, um, they changed the recommendation um, for all just general patients, regardless, you know, no, not even considering IVD, it is recommended that all adults age 19 to 59 um, get hepatitis B vaccination. Um, HPV or human papillomavirus is one that um, typically is started in, in childhood or administered in childhood. Um, but it's up to age 26, but the guidelines add the caveat that if people are on a medication that affects the immune system, consider giving it to adults up to age 45. Um, and then Haemophilus influenza, and then tetanus and pertussis, which are usually administered together as Tdap, um, patients should be getting a booster about every 10 years. And then I get um, often questions about the COVID vaccine. So obviously this is a newer area, but the data, I'm gonna go through the data that we have. Um, so our guidelines recommend getting the two preferred, the mRNA vaccine. So that's two initial doses. But if there is some reason that the mRNA is not available for a particular patient, the single dose um, Johnson & Johnson vaccine is also considered acceptable. Um, as far as response to the vaccines, there were some studies that showed lower antibody levels of response um, in patients on biologic medicines who received vaccine, the COVID vaccines. However, that did not correlate uh, clinically to a higher risk of people getting breakthrough COVID infections or having worse COVID outcomes. Um, for patients on um, biologics or immunomodulators, a third primary dose of the mRNA vaccines is recommended. And then booster doses are recommended for all IBD patients. So that includes the newer um, Omicron specific variant uh, booster that has been out recently. Um, another thing I frequently get asked is, do I need to time the COVID vaccine in relation to my IBD therapy? Um, so that's usually more so with the biologics, um, not, which are not taken every day, but it's not necessary to, to work around the timing of your biologic medication. And then for people on a daily medication, like the small molecules, it's not necessarily not necessary to hold those medicines um, to get the COVID vaccine. Um, studies have not shown any increased risk of having a severe reaction against the vaccine in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. Um, that was pretty similar across the board, somewhere around 1% to 2% for all patients, depending on the study. And then they specifically had um, a study looking, or actually a couple studies, but this is the biggest one, um, looking at the risk of IBD flare in patients who got COVID vaccines. Um, and so they had nearly a thousand patients in each group. So vaccinated versus unvaccinated IBD patients. And um, only six patients in the vaccinated group had a severe IBD flare. And then actually there was more in the unvaccinated group 13 who had an IBD flare during the study time period. And moving on to um, colon cancer prevention. So this is important for patients with ulcerative colitis if it extends further up or beyond the rectum or for Crohn's disease if it involves a significant portion or a third or more of the colon um, because there's been noted an increased risk um, for colon cancer 
when people have long-standing disease or inflammation affecting the colon. It's important to point out that this risk does decrease in patients where we are able to get the inflammatory bowel disease into deep remission, where everything looks healed up and normal on colonoscopy. And so that's one of the important reasons that we aim for that goal when we're um, using our IBD treatments. As far as kind of surveillance, so colonoscopy is recommended every one to two years for people who um, have the, that colon inflammation um, starting at eight years from their diagnosis uh, to screen for early changes for cancer. Sometimes if people are in very deep, stable remission, we can consider extending that interval out longer to three years. Um, another thing to be aware of is sometimes when you're getting your colonoscopy for surveillance, the doctor may use something called chromoendoscopy, which refers to uh, using a blue dye that is sprayed on the walls of the colon that helps highlight or helps us see some subtle changes um, that could indicate that dysplasia. However, using that chromoendoscopy can sometimes be limited. Um, so if the inflammatory bowel disease is active, it can be difficult to distinguish inflammation from those subtle dysplasia changes. Also, sometimes people with ulcerative colitis um, or Crohn's affecting the colon can develop something called pseudopolyps when the inflammation heals up, it leaves some pseudopolyps behind. Or obviously, if the bowel preparation is not completely clean, can make it also difficult to get a good exam. Um, as far as uh, special considerations for colon cancer screening, um, there is a coexisting um, autoimmune issue called primary sclerosis and cholangitis, which affects the liver or the bile ducts in the liver, which can sometimes happen along with Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. And so if a patient has those two things together, Unfortunately, there has been shown an even more increased risk um, for that colon dysplasia or changes towards cancer. And so it's recommended to start screening right away rather than waiting eight years from diagnosis in that case. Another special case is ulcerative proctitis. So that is inflammation only involving the rectum or the very end part of the colon. And so the studies have shown that actually patients with ulcerative proctitis do not seem to have that increased um, colon cancer risk. And so therefore those patients can follow just the general um, screening guidelines and also taking into consideration family history, which the general guidelines do. And then lastly, um, in patients who have a, um, a total colectomy or proctocolectomy where the entire colon is removed and then decide to have a ileal J pouch um, there, when they do that surgery, there is still a couple inches um, or centimeters of rectum tissue remaining at the very end. And so because that is still present, there are patients where surveillance is still recommended for that, uh, for that rectal tissue, um, especially if there had been any history of dysplasia or cancer um, or that PSC that I mentioned. And then this is just to illustrate what I was talking about with that chromoendoscopy. So um, on the pictures on the left, so picture A is the regular view of the colon without using the blue dye. And then you can see in picture B, after spraying the blue dye, um, we can more easily see this, um, this area that does not take up the blue very well is potentially concerning for an area of dysplasia. And then um, the picture on the right is illustrating those pseudopolyps that I was talking about. And so you can see with all those extra bumps on there from the pseudopolyps, especially if there's very many of them, it can make it difficult um, to be able to distinguish using, even using that blue dye. Other, um, other cancer screenings. Um, so for women, cervical cancer screening, so the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology recommends that all patients on immunosuppressive medications should have annual um, pap smears rather than every three years. And then there is some data out there actually saying um, all female patients with Crohn's disease seem to have some increased risk for cervical cancer, regardless of whether they're on an immunosuppressive medicine. And so some studies have actually advocated for annual pap smears regardless of being on an immunosuppressive medication. 
And then just a note again, kind of about the um, lower um, health maintenance in IBD patients. It's been shown that only 70% of women with inflammatory bowel disease get a screening pap smear every three years, which is the guideline for the general population. And then skin cancers, all patients with IBD should be using sun protection, regardless of medication, because there's been shown to be an increased risk of melanoma. But then specifically patients on these, some of these immunosuppressive medications should have a dermatology evaluation followed by at least annual um, skin exams. So specifically for the anti-TNF biologics because of a, a slight increase in melanoma risk. And then also the um, immunomodulators, azathioprine and sigmorecaptopurine because of increased risk of non-melanoma skin cancers. Osteoporosis screening. So this usually follows more so the general guidelines for screening aside, the exception is for patients who have been on steroids. And so the, um, the big point here is people who have been on doses of 7.5 milligrams of prednisone daily or higher for three or more months are considered at increased risk of osteoporosis. And so they should have um, DEXA scan or screening for osteoporosis earlier than those age guidelines. And then modifiable risk factors are things that patients can change. Um, so NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs have been associated with um, IBD flares. And this holds true even in people who are in remission. Um, so for example, one study showed that um, 17 to 28% of patients who start who took an NSAID um, had a relapse of their inflammatory bowel disease within a short time, within nine days, you can see of starting that medication. The data, that being said, is a little less clear um, for the selective NSAID, which includes um, um, Celebrex or Celecoxib. And then the other modifiable risk factor is smoking, specifically for Crohn's disease. So it's been well studied and described that Crohn's is strongly affected by smoking. It increases risk for hospitalizations, need for surgery, failing medication, and then relapse. Um, it's also associated with um, more severe types of Crohn's disease where it gets to the point of causing penetrating disease, meaning fistulas or perianal disease. Um, and then um, inflammatory bowel disease related arthritis is also higher with smoking. Quitting, on the other hand, has been shown to decrease flares, decrease the need for prednisone for steroids, and decrease the need for uh, those immunomodulators. And so the importance of quitting cannot be strongly emphasized enough. So in conclusion, like we talked about, there are some additional health maintenance um, items that need to be taken into consideration for patients with IBD, including vaccines, additional cancer screenings, and bone density testing. Those immunosuppressive medications, while they can be critical to get the disease in control for some patients, do require some additional, additional preventive measures. Um, we talked about the more intensive uh, colon cancer screening that is required, um, and then those modifiable risk factors that can affect the course of inflammatory bowel disease. And then just so um, patients are more aware of this increased preventive care, I think can help improve those, those rates that I mentioned at the beginning, because some of these guidelines are under-recognized. Thank you very much for your attention. Have a great rest of your morning. Uh, thank you, Megan, for highlighting the often underemphasized aspect of uh, health maintenance in IBD. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Satya Kurada, he uh, is an assistant professor of, medicine, of clinical medicine at Indiana University. He has dual interest both in inflammatory bowel diseases as well as uh, celiac disease. Um, he practices out of the VA and also has a clinic uh, at IU Saxony and Fishers. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, the recent uh, and upcoming research aspects in IBD. Uh, thank you, Satya. Sorry. Um, hmm. 
I'm having some difficulty getting into it. Yeah, the... just click click on your slide and then you can forward it with your arrow. Just click on it once and then it will work. No? If you, uh, you just use the arrows, the uh, down arrow and see if it works once you click on the slide. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I was uh I can take control if we want to start if it's not working. You can just tell me next slide. So I can't actually see my slides all. Uh I don't know why my video is only showing up. Uh the view side by side speaker. okay uh are you able to see my view? we can see your slides yeah you can see the slides okay um i'm uh, uh satya and uh, i'll be talking to you briefly about research snippets uh in IBD. This is essentially some uh, new research that has come out uh, this year in 2022. Um, and most of this may not be applicable uh, right now, but I anticipate in the next five to 10 years, uh, what I'm presenting today will become very relevant both to patients and physicians treating IBD patients. So uh, briefly today, we're going to talk about artificial in intelligence in IBD. Uh, and then we'll move into some new and interesting associations uh, in patients with IBD, which have been uh, uh, become, uh, becoming increasingly uh, visible in the limelight. And then last, uh, and then we'll be going into some new diagnostic uh, tests, which will increasingly become relevant in the future some therapeutic dilemmas which patients as well as uh, physicians uh, have. And at this point, I'll say patients because uh, both phys uh, treatment of IBD is shared decision-making and uh, some of these things are necessary to be known to patients as well as to physicians. And, the, uh, and towards the end, we'll be just looking at some, I call it old wine in a new bottle. Essentially what that means is uh, old medications being used in uh, different uh, routes of administrations or different doses of administration and if, how effective they are. And lastly, we'll just look at some head-to-head -head trials between uh, uh, commonly used biologics or FDA-approved biologics at this point in time. So I'll move on and talk to you about uh, artificial uh, intelligence. Uh, this is basic. This slide basically shows AI's capabilities of uh, mimicking human physicians in their understanding, judgment, as well as predicting uh, treatment for their uh, and disease scores for their patients. Uh, what AI includes is uh, inputting data. This could be standard data like lab tests or unstructured data, uh, which might actually include key buzzwords from clinical notes, as well as uh, maybe even patient messages that we constantly get from uh, uh, on our portals. And then essentially what happens in the next step is there's going to be, uh, there is data annotation, essentially tagging key buzzwords, uh, both in the labs or in the imaging studies or maybe in clinical notes, and then feeding that into, uh, uh, into a computer essentially and training the computer initially, so developing training models, and then finally validating it and kind of reverse engineering, which is making the, which is called machine learning. You're essentially making the computer learn the patterns that you're seeing, and then eventually down the line, apply it to patients uh, and, and use it for research, for making new uh, medications, or even figuring out the disease course and the next steps of treatment for your patient. So those are all the different steps. 
Uh, I'll show you, uh, these are a few examples of how artificial intelligence is used by computers. Uh, essentially, the, the graph on the left, uh, uh, all, of, all patients usually get their fecal calprotectins, but can that actually predict which patients will go into surgery or not need surgery in the future, or even currently for that matter? You can also have these decision trees uh, where you can kind of score different uh, disease characteristics and predict if people will get surgery in the future or not. For example, a, pa a young patient has developed strictures already and then eventually uh, is, a, uh, uh, you know, uh, and eventually, are you able to see my pointer on the slide? Yes, we are. You are, okay. Okay. Uh, so, for example, if it's a young patient, he's smoking, he has strictures, the chance that he'll have surgery is high. So these are essentially decision trees uh, that will predict if a patient will have surgery or not. Or you can apply artificial in intelligence uh, using some neural networks, which the computer will start recognizing, uh, and then eventually will uh, assist a physician or a radiologist or an endoscopist to score how bad the disease is. Uh, so essentially, we can use artificial intelligence across the board, whether it be radiology, path reports, or even looking at clinical reports. Uh, this is an example of natural language processing. As you can see over here, you have a, a physician's note and then you can, uh, the computer can start. And as we go into the age of electronic medical records, most of the country now has electronic medical records. You can start tagging buzzwords. For example, if they say, uh, if, a, uh, if the note says there is urgency, frequency, the patient is already on an anti-TNF and now is flaring. So you can develop certain algorithms with different permutations and combinations. And essentially the computer can tell you if the patient is flaring or not. And let's assume they are on an anti-TNF. It can maybe help make a decision for us that it's time to escalate to or, or change treatment or disease uh, uh, Yeah, change treatment essentially based on these various permutations and combinations. So in the future, I anticipate that artificial intelligence will essentially take over conventional treatments wherein a radiologist is reading a CT scan or an endoscopist is reading his endoscopy reports and making decisions uh, uh, to a stage where artificial intelligence may not necessarily substitute a human physician, but can at least assist a human physician as uh, IBD treatments become more and more uh, complicated. Already we have seven or eight drugs in the market and we anticipate, you know, in the next 15, 20 years, probably there'll be 20 or 30. And, and then at that point, it probably becomes humanly impossible to analyze some of this data. And at that point, like in cancer treatment, and at that point, we may need uh, assistance from a computer. So this is all exciting, and I thought uh, this is something patients should know about. Uh, sounds like sci-fi, but it's coming down the line. Uh, next, we'll move into our, actually, let me uh, go back. We'll next look into some interesting associations with IBD. Uh, one interesting association that I found is this, basically uh, a study which shows that uh, IBD patients, especially Crohn's patients who had complications like surgeries or strictures or fistula, these kind of people are uh, uh, prone to developing uh, metabolic fatty acid, uh, fatty liver disease. As you know, we have an uh, obesity epidemic in our country. And uh, traditionally, the risk factors were thought to be diabetes, hypertension, uh, belly fat, and things like that. But uh, this particular study throws light into the fact that exclude uh, even after controlling for all these various risk factors, Crohn's disease itself is associated with fatty liver disease. And that, that's basically what's highlighted over here. 
We'll move on to the other thing. Uh, I think Dr. Fisher talked about cognitive be uh, behavior therapy, about how uh, we can use our mind to control our inflammation or our flares. This study actually proves that patients who have increased stress perception will eventually have an ulcerative colitis flare. And uh, how do we measure high stress perception? We can measure it by actually putting electrodes on the skin and looking at the sympathetic tone. So maybe not... Uh, not just looking at uh, subjective data, we may have actually tools may hopefully coming up in the future where a patient can actually put these skin receptors uh, uh, on themselves and actually assess their levels of stress and maybe then participate in cognitive behavior therapy and get some kind of active feedback from the machine saying, uh, okay, you're stressed, you got, uh, and then now your stress levels have come down and hopefully you can keep yourself away from a flare. So this is also some interesting things, uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, studies uh, that I felt were relevant uh, 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 to a patient population, which will probably become more popular in the future. Uh, we'll now move on into new diagnostic tests for IBD. Uh, I, it's the misery of both the patients as well as the treating physicians about uh, commonly ordering CT scans, MRIs. It's cost prohibitive for the healthcare system for the uh, and on patients uh, to pay for all these tests. Uh, we know all these patients, all IBD patients, get CT scans, MRIs are subject to radiation and things, uh, dye exposures, kidney failure, and things like that. So now we probably can get away uh, with uh, repeated CT scans and MRIs by this point of care ultrasound. Essentially what this is, is just like every time you come, a patient might come into uh, the clinic and get a blood, a blood draw uh, or a stool sample to assess inflammation, we can probably start assessing uh, healing of uh, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease for that matter by measuring the thickness of the intestinal wall. And so this, uh, this is essentially what this image is trying to show. Uh, uh, again, uh, I don't want to bog down the audience with numbers and p-values. All we want to show is that it works, that bowel wall thickness can be a measure of endoscopic activity as well as uh, uh, histological, that is to say, uh, pathological activity uh, of disease uh, uh, in ulcerative colitis. And then finally, uh, we'll move on to our next segment, uh, looking at some therapeutic dilemmas. Uh, and I think this uh, patients need to know about some of these recent trials so that, uh, you know, some of the mis uh, or misconceptions uh, uh, and, you know, pressing questions that treating cl uh, clinicians as well as uh, uh, patients have are hopefully addressed uh, by some of these questions which came out in 2022 as research papers. So a lot, uh, we already know a lot of uh, patients who are on anti-TNFs, which is to say uh, uh, Humira and Remicade generally are put on Imuron or methotrexate to, uh, to uh, uh, prevent uh, antibody formation and the loss of efficacy of these medications. Uh, and it, uh, it is also shown through to established trials that uh, they actually cause uh, uh, better rates of remission. I, uh, I, in other words, uh, treatment of IBD. Uh, but there is very little data about whether we should be putting uh, patients on vedolizumab and Stellara uh, which are other disease uh, or rather other drug classes uh, in the treatment of IBD on Imuran uh, and or uh, methotrexate for antibody formation. So essentially the study shows that the newer biologics do not or the newer class of biologics do not need any um, combination therapy to prevent antibody formation or prevention of, uh, or, uh, <clears throat> or in creating better remission rates. Uh, 
We'll move on to the next question. And this can be an issue uh, for treating physicians and patients too. Uh, we are, uh, patients are often on biologics and lo and behold, they flare and they may need surgery. Uh, so then the question becomes, is it safe to put an immunosuppressed patient through uh, under the knife without developing complications? So this study was done uh, uh, over a period of two to three years. And uh, basically what this study shows is that even if you had Remicade or Humera in your blood, you can go under the knife because, uh, and there is no risk of general infections happening in the post-operative period and or any surgical infections happening. But the major risk factor that you, uh, physicians and patients should be worried about is whether they've been on steroids recently or around the time of surgery or have badly controlled diabetes. Those are the risk factors which lead to increased complications not being on a biologic. So uh, patients can feel reassured, God forbid uh, you do need surgery, uh, you should go ahead and have surgery. Uh, and the, la uh, the next question, this is kind of, I call the swinging of the pendulum, uh, whether patients should actually keep getting their drug levels checked proactively whereas versus reactively, which is the con uh, conventional management. So in the past, there were some papers which said that even if the patient is not flaring, you should keep getting your drug levels checked and adjustment of doses based on those drug levels. But this was a meta-analysis which looked at a combination of seven or eight studies. And what essentially it is saying is there is no need to keep checking drug levels if the patient is not flaring, i.e. proactive uh, therapeutic drug monitoring is not necessary. Only conventional, that is uh, to say if the patient has flared, only then keep checking the drug levels and adjust your treatment according to that. Um, it, uh, and because there is really no difference in uh, causing uh, a better clinical outcome in terms of controlling the disease when you use proactive uh, drug monitoring. So, and then we'll move on now to something called as old wine in the new bottle. Uh, essentially, uh, different routes of administration of already established biologics. The first study is looking at IV versus subcutaneous Remicade. Uh, we all know it's a uh, uh, it's a pain to come to an infusion center, sit there for one or two hours, or maybe even three hours, check in, pay a copay. It increases costs for the patient as well as the healthcare system. So, can we get away with doing something subcutaneously at home? And this study essentially uh, tries to prove that uh, that subq uh, remicade is as good as IV. Uh, and so what happens is we are, um, if a patient is on IV Remicade and they are in clinical remission as well as their calprotect and their stool inflammation is well controlled, uh, we could use every other week uh, subcutaneous dosing depending on your pre-subcutaneous IV dose that you're requiring. Uh, and there is data to show that it is uh, equally good in uh, causing induction. And the last question is, do we keep escalating uh, the doses of uh, Humera, uh, Humera? That was the next question. There were some seminal trials which came out called serine UC and uh, uh, serine ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. And essentially what these studies were trying to show is do we keep escalating the loading doses of Humera? And... Uh, and the answer is no, whether you use a higher dose or a lower dose, both in ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, there is no difference in uh, clinical healing uh, uh, in the loading phase. And even in the maintenance phase, there's very minimal uh, effect in using a higher dose based on both these trials. And we'll compare one last question, uh, I'm sure, physicians as well as patients have been through this uh, uh, 
uh, drill where the insurance is going to deny a uh, first dose of Stellara or Humira unless you failed Remicade or Infliximab. Uh, uh, and essentially, uh, what this study is showing is that uh, Stellara, uh, Stellara uh, which is a newer biologic, uh, in, is equally efficacious to the older established uh, uh, biologics such as Humira in causing clinical healing. Uh, as uh, So essentially, it wouldn't be wrong to put a patient who's never had any biologic before uh, on Stellara as the first uh, dose, as long as you're, uh, uh, or rather first biologic, as long as your insurance pays for it. Uh, so hopefully this, uh, this study will uh, kind of drill it into insurance companies that Stellara can be used as a first line biologic. So that's my... Uh, uh, you know, conclusion uh, of the study kind of highlighting the main uh, uh, research questions for this, uh, for 2022, hopefully next year, we'll get more research in and more uh, questions uh, that are answered, which are relevant to both patients and their physicians. Uh, thank you, Satya, for that excellent overview. Um, I will be talking about uh, current research at uh, IU, um, and specifically for the purpose of the talk uh, and for the sake of time, uh, I, have, I will not be talking about drug trials. We, we do have several drug trials with biologics and uh, small molecules, but for the purpose of this talk, I'll be focusing on trials which, uh, for the most part, do not involve uh, drugs. My main disclosure is that I received research support uh, for one of the studies that uh, I conduct here at IU from a company called ElectroCore. Um, the, I'm gonna talk about the study itself. The company does not actually, uh, you know, is, invo is not involved in planning the study or conducting the study. They just provide the devices, which I will talk about um, in the later slides. Um, and the other, re other disclosures I have is some contacted research with uh, drug trials with companies that are listed below. So the first study that I'm going to talk about is uh, what is called FibroScan study. Um, as Dr. Kurada pointed out, uh, there is an increased incidence of uh, metabolic uh, liver disease in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. And uh, data suggests that there is uh, a prevalence up to 60% in IBD patients and is associated with increased uh, morbidity as well as mortality. And due to the wide variability in the incidence, depending on the criteria that are used for diagnosis, this is a study that uh, we planned at IU and uh, it is an ultrasound uh, test um, or ultrasound based test, which measures the stiffness of the liver and it's a device called FibroScan. Um, any patient with IBD is eligible for this trial, and um, it basically takes uh, about five minutes to actually do the scan itself. Uh, it is done uh, during the clinic visit. Uh, all we need is uh, for the participant to be fasting for uh, two hours prior to the scan so that we get an accurate result. And this study will hopefully help us uh, better understand the prevalence of uh, metabolic liver disease or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and um, the effect of uh, treatments on the incidence and prevalence of this. The other next study that uh, I'm part of is uh, non-invasive vagus nerve stimulation for Crohn's disease. The background for this is uh, that in patients with uh, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, we know uh, that there is uh, evidence of decreased vagal nerve tone, and this is associated with increased uh, tumor necrosis factor levels. And uh, if you recall from you know the presentation by uh, Dr. Abdul Jawad, anti-TNFs are uh, one of the mainstay of biologic therapy, mainly Humira, Remicade, uh, Simsia, these kind of drugs work by blocking uh, tumor necrosis factor. Um, activity. 
And studies have uh, demonstrated that stimulating the vagus nerve um, has an anti-inflammatory effect, and it also reduces uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha levels, and thereby you know, uh, having an anti-inflammatory effect on inflammatory bowel disease as well. And uh, studies conducted in Europe where they actually implanted uh, vagus nerve stimulators um, surgically uh, with an operation, a little device, uh, just like people who have pacemakers uh, for heart disease. Uh, these were implanted and uh, patients were followed after implantation of these vagal nerve stimulators and were found to have improvement in their Crohn's disease uh, symptoms as well as uh, disease activity. So the aim of uh, this study was uh, to assess the safety and efficacy of non-invasive vagal stimulation. Uh, and I'm going to you know, talk about what that means, meaning that you know, this is not an implanted device in patients with mild to moderate Crohn's disease. And the hypothesis being that we, we will be able to decrease inflammation and improve symptoms in patients uh, with Crohn's disease. And uh, we are enrolling patients with mild to moderate Crohn's disease who are on stable treatment. Um, with mild to moderate symptoms and evidence of active inflammation uh, based on a stool test, uh, which is the stool calprotectin level uh, being more than 200 uh, micrograms per gram. And this is the device itself. Uh, the device is uh, about the size of uh, an electric shaver, um, as you can see on the right. And it is, it is a handheld device. It is currently approved for treatment of cluster headaches and migraines. And it involves uh, using this device for stimulating the vagus nerve uh, by you know, placing it on the, on the neck. On the left side, uh, for two minutes, uh, three times a day uh, for about 16 weeks. And it all, additionally, there are like blood tests uh, and stool tests. And also, uh, we get a baseline EKG at uh, each visit to make sure that you know, this device is not affecting any uh, or causing any heart problems. Though uh, the trials in the past um, have not shown any effect on any significant effect on heart rhythm, this is just a safety uh, parameter. And the outcomes we are um, hoping to study are symptoms and improvement in inflammation. And as I mentioned, uh, the company provides the devices uh, for research, but they're not involved in planning or conducting this uh, trial. The next trial that we have uh, is a registry. Uh, this is uh, sponsored by the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation as part of the uh, uh, research initiatives uh, and is a funded study which involves uh, a prospective adult research cohort of IBD patients uh, with plan to enroll up to 7,000 patients involving multiple centers throughout the US. And the aim is to collect and link clinical data patient outcomes, i.e. symptoms, uh, serial samples, including blood samples, uh, stool samples, biopsies obtained at um, colonoscopy, and thereby build a comprehensive database for basic uh, clinical and translational research and the goal of uh, finding predictors for response to therapy, predictors of relapse, and identifying precision medicine strategies for newer targets uh, for IBD. And all adult patients with IBD are eligible. And this study is led by Dr. Matthew Bohm, um, whom you heard from earlier. Uh, Dr. Monica Fisher leads this uh, study on uh, fecal microbiota transplantation for recurrent C. diff infections in uh, patients with IBD. Um, we know that IBD patients are at an increased risk of uh, recurrent C. diff infection and C. diff infection by itself can cause a flare up of the IBD and worsen disease severity. And the aim of this study is to assess the efficacy of uh, fecal microbiota transplantation in, in combination with uh, bezlotoximab, which is an approved uh, treatment for um, approved monoclonal antibody treatment for recurrent C. diff infection. And uh, Patients who are undergoing uh, stool transplantation as part of uh, standard medical care via colonoscopy um, are eligible uh, to participate in the study. And once they receive the colonoscopy, they're randomized to either placebo or uh, bezlotoximab. Um, and uh, the plan is to study outcomes in terms of uh, recurrence of C. diff infection uh, after uh, 
the use of bezlotaximab with the SO transplant or without. The next study is a COMPASS uh, study. This is also read by Dr. Monica Fisher. Um, this involves a blood test called CDPATH, uh, which is an approved test for predicting disease course in Crohn's disease. And the aim of this is to uh, use this test to describe the risk profile of patients with uh, Crohn's disease in real world practice. So patients with Crohn's disease who were diagnosed within the past five years and uh, who are willing to undergo this test and answer uh, a series of electronic uh, symptom questionnaires um, are eligible to participate. And the idea is that based on the results of the test, um, we can discuss the results and potential management options based on uh, clinical judgment. Dr. Kurada leads uh, this study on volatile organic compounds in IBD. Uh, the background for this is that uh, there is a, a distinct pattern of uh, volatile organic compounds in the breath and blood samples in IBD subjects. And it, we have an electronic device, what's called an electronic nose, uh, which detects these volatile organic compounds. And this is used to assess the profile of uh, volatile organic compounds for um, diagnosis, uh, risk stratification, and prediction of disease course in IBD. And all adult patients with IBD are eligible, and the intervention involves uh, collecting breath samples, urine uh, samples, stool, and blood samples, and it requires fasting for about eight hours. Dr. Kurada also leads uh, the registry uh, for IBD and celiac disease. Um, Patients with IBD and celiac disease have unique disease characteristics. And the aim of this is to study the natural history of IBD and celiac disease and the effects of IBD treatment and uh, gluten-free diet on patients with uh, IBD and celiac disease. And lastly, we have a celiac disease registry. Um, celiac disease affects about 1% of the uh, US population. And the aim of this registry is to assess disease characteristics prospectively follow these subjects um, and assess the quality of care and clinical outcomes. And uh, there are upcoming uh, trials which uh, involve gluten degrading enzymes, uh, which can potentially be uh, very helpful in uh, these patients so that they can potentially consume gluten uh, or at least you know, have some exposure to gluten uh, without worrying about uh, having uh, symptoms related to um, celiac disease. Thank you all for your attention and thank you to the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation for this opportunity. If uh, any of you are interested in participating in our, re our research trials or um, wanting to learn more, uh, please uh, feel free to email uh, to this uh, email address and we'll be happy to uh, provide you the information uh, or answer any questions. Next, uh, we will uh, be taking questions. So feel free to uh, put in questions in the chat and um, I will be uh, directing questions to our panel uh, and we'll be happy to answer uh, any questions that you might have. Um, Satya, I have a question in the chat. Uh, the question is from Mary Jane, and she's asking if celiac disease is part of IBD. Great question. It, it is not, but there is a sub-segment of, pop, of, of, of the population where uh, you do have celiac disease overlapping with IBD. Um, and I'm trying to, uh, interested in seeing what the disease outcomes for IBD is in patients who've been uh, on, uh, on and not very adherent to a gluten-free diet and vice versa, uh, what does, uh, um, uh, you know, what, uh, what does, uh, uh, or what effect does it have on the course of IBD for that matter? So yes, it is not, a, uh, there is no clear association, uh, but there is a subsegment of population which has it.
feel free to come off mute and ask any questions or just continue to type them in the Q&A section. This is the final segment of today is really to give you all the opportunity as participants to ask these questions. So again, please generalize them. Um, they'll get specific health information out, but um, we're, we're ready and here to answer any questions you have. Satya, there's uh, another question for you. Uh, is there an association with Crohn's and metabolic disease or just fatty liver? The literature that I read essentially shows, uh, at least the paper that I that was uh, that we talked about was in 2022, and there is an association with fatty liver. But yes, there uh, there are studies which show that in general there are there's a subsegment of IBD patients who have obesity. We generally tend to think about IBD patients. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, IBD patients to be malnourished and underweight and things like that. But there is a big segment of a population which is uh, obese. And that goes with the general trend of increasing obesity in the general U.S. population. So I don't see why it should not be applicable to IBD patients. Uh, they do have metabolic uh, issues. Uh, yes, again, because they're on uh, they might be on biologics which are affecting the lipid profile. So that is uh, that is also something that uh, we cannot ignore. And uh, we probably need to be aggressive in managing hyperlipidemia and th uh, things like that. Um, just One thing that... Uh, edit real quick. If you have a question, I apologize, we're using a new type of service. Just raise your hand and then we'll call on you and you can be live. Uh, just to add on what uh, Dr. Kurada just mentioned, uh, studies do show that uh, the prevalence of uh, metabolic uh, or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease uh, is higher in IBD patients, even uh, relative to the general population. So there seems to be some uh, something that is related to IBD that puts patients at a higher risk having, of having fatty liver disease. So uh, I have a question in the chat. Uh, Khaled, can you uh, take this on? This is about uh, you know, a woman on biologics uh, thinking about pregnancy and what are the recommendations on handling biologics in general? Yeah, that's a good question. As a general rule, uh, before getting into pregnancy, we recommend to have a stable and controlled disease. So that's the first rule. Um, and then... Uh, all biologics are safe during pregnancy, so we, we don't recommend stopping them or decreasing the doses or intervals uh, because we want to try to keep uh, the disease inactive as much as possible to have better outcomes with the pregnancy. So we continue biologics. There are some debates about maybe holding the, uh, the biologics toward the very end of the pregnancy, um, especially with Remicade, but as a general rule, they are uh, safe and we continue them. I think in the most recent guidelines, you know, uh, they specifically uh, mentioned that we should not be holding or uh, trying to time biologics. So overall, you know, the field has evolved uh, and there's plenty of data indicating the safety of biologics uh, through pregnancy. I see Nadine has a question. Nadine, if you'd like to come off mute to ask your question. Or you can put it in the chat. Sylvia, it looks like you have a question. Yes, I just wanted to, okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. I just wanted to confirm, did Dr. Walker say if you had ulcerated proctitis, you were less, there was less risk of you getting colon cancer? 
Yes, yeah, so I guess not so less compared to people who have ulcerative colitis involving more of the colon. So it puts as far as the guidelines go, you go back into the kind of the general population guidelines. So depending on your family history um, or risk factors like that. Um, so not, not lower than general population, but the risk is lower compared to more extensive ulcerative colitis. I got it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the question. Is loss of weight ever advised for people with the ulcerative colitis? Matt, can you answer that? Yes, uh, we. Weight loss is okay if if you're if you're uh, in remission. We don't want people losing weight becoming underweight. So if you're overweight and you're losing weight and you have a history of Crohn's or also colitis, that's okay. If that answers your question, is that what you were looking for? Yes, uh, that helps. Thanks, Nadine. Yeah, I've sent people uh, with Crohn's and also colitis for weight loss surgery. We don't recommend like gastric bypass or anything like that, but a gastric sleeve is, is an option for people with inflammatory bowel disease and, and just routine weight loss um, treatment is, is okay. Mary Jane, you have a question? Okay, yeah, uh, this is Mary Jane. Um, is it a good idea to um, um, not eat anything to, uh, to I just uh, lost my thought here, um, to um, like in 24 hours only drink water or or something uh, to cleanse out your colon or your intestines and everything to cleanse them, uh, to not eat for like 24 hours or something. Is that a good idea with, uh, it, with someone that has Crohn's or I have an ileostomy bag. So um, is that a good thing? There's a word there I'm thinking of and I can't think of it where you, um, do not eat for like uh, a day or two. Like fasting? Yes, fasting. That's it, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. <laughs> Mary, this is Monica, Monica Fisher. It's not a good idea for you. Okay. I definitely, I definitely would recommend that you keep hydrated and there's like no, really no studies to that show in the benefit of uh, you know fasting or even intermittent fasting necessary for Crohn's disease. So, and especially I'm with someone who has somewhat limited absorptive surface, we do not recommend fasting. Okay. Is there um, a method where you cleanse your uh, intestines or? I mean, especially when missing colon, you don't need to cleanse the small bowel. It okay. naturally doesn't need to be cleansed. And actually it's very important to continue to, uh, maintain enteral nutrition, a diet uh, that's very important for the maintain maintenance of integrity of the lining of your small bowel. So many, right. many studies show that uh, when we um, seize or stop feeding patients PO orally, and we just give them nutrition through their vein, uh, the lining of the gut really suffers, okay? Okay, all including, right. Including increased risk of infection and sepsis because, you know, the barrier between the gut uh, flora uh, or the lumen and the blood will uh, be injured and because of the starvation, okay? And then toxins from the gut lumen can enter into the blood, okay? Okay, okay. So we really don't recommend that. Okay, thank you, Dr. Fisher. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mary. 
if you have any other questions. What is the uh, impact of genetic factors in the development of ulcerative colitis? So, uh, Nadine, that's a good question. Um, I think uh, there was a slide by Dr. Abdul Jawad when he first went over uh, briefly over the how you know we think um, IBD develops. So far, there are about 250 genes that have been identified um, to be associated with inflammatory bowel disease, and the number keeps on growing as you know uh, they find find more and more associations. But having the genes is not enough to cause disease. There's something that uh, happens beyond genes with the interaction with the gut microbiome and uh, the environment that triggers and perpetrates inflammation. Um, so uh, I hope that answers your question. Yes. We have another question in the chat here. Is it possible to have Crohn's in terminal ileum and not have surgery? I can answer this. Uh, yeah, of course, uh, especially if we catch the disease early on at uh, what we call the inflammatory stage, uh, because at that stage, uh, we can heal the inflammation and prevent what might cause surgery, which is uh, uh, developing uh, narrowings or scar tissue or what we call strictures. Um, um, so yeah, of course, if we catch the disease early and act early on with good treatments and effective treatments, uh, then yeah, we, we, we might avoid surgeries. All right. Well, we are a little over time. I appreciate all of our panelists so much for their expertise today, for sharing their really hard work on, you know, making um, advancements for our IBD community and as well as communicating that with our IBD community um, because that's how we all will benefit, right? And so we just want to thank everybody for their participation today, for their great questions, great answers, great research, all of the things. As the new executive director of the foundation in Indiana, I also want to thank you all for taking time out on your weekend to be a part of this great conversation. If there's anything that we didn't get to that you have questions about, I would advise that you talk to your doctor about it or feel free to um, reach out to our IBD Help Center so that we can help solicit those questions that you may have. Um, but again, Dr. Sagi and the entire IU team, thank you so much um, for putting this on today for us once again. And I hope everybody has happy and healthy holiday season. Bye. Thank you all very all right, much. Thank you. Have a good day.